Seemingly every single year, we have to hear it. Rex Ryan guarantees that his team's going to win a Super Bowl. Although he tempered those notions his last few seasons with the New York Jets. And as the new head coach of the Buffalo Bills, oh yes, oh yes, Ryan is back at it again. Guaranteeing that a Super Bowl is going to happen. The charismatic, brash, and unique character that is Rex Ryan always puts the spotlight on himself. But as big as his ego definitely is, the way I've always seen it, it's to take all the attention off his players. While a Super Bowl this year is obviously a long shot, it's not going to happen. Asking for a playoff appearance for the first time in 15 years, the longest drought in the NFL, it definitely isn't. It's definitely possible. After putting up a 9-7 and mark last year, Buffalo's best since 2004, Doug Marone didn't return. He claims that he didn't quit, that he opted out, but the way I look at it, he definitely overrated his value. He interviewed with the Jets, Atlanta Falcons, and Chicago Bears for head coaching openings. I mean, he definitely wanted to have a sexier head coaching gig. He's now with the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, as the offensive line coach. I mean, uh, obviously that head coaching gig is going to have to wait. Obviously the big blockbuster was the acquisition of LaShawn McCoy, who was traded to the Bills by the Philadelphia Eagles for fan favorite Kiko Alonso. McCoy's contract may be $10 million more than Alonzo's, but he's a valuable cog for Rex Ryan's ground-and-pound style. McCoy didn't fit what Chip Kelly wanted to do in Philadelphia. He's not the one-cut runner that Chip covets. He's a dancer. The Eagles' offensive line was in shambles the first eight weeks of the season, and McCoy predictably struggled. But as the unit got healthier, McCoy's production started to soar. Some in Philadelphia even you know, went as far to say that he lost a step. Well, I completely disagree. McCoy's in a great situation. Sure, the Eagles were his favorite team growing up, but he's going to get the rock. And what, you know, a perfect offensive coordinator he has to run the ball for. I mean, there is nobody more creative with his running formations than new offensive coordinator Greg Roman. Sure, the Buffalo offensive line isn't the best, but I, I think McCoy's going to be just fine. Another thing I wanted to point out, Chip loves the one-cut runner because that's the type of back, you know, that always gets three to four yards on first down. Kelly's offense is predicated on getting yardage on first down, especially the first play of every series. That's how the offense gets into a rhythm for the duration of the drive. But a lot of times, McCoy would dance and lose the yardage on first down. Two plays later, the Eagles would be punting. Well, in Buffalo, he can afford to dance because while... He will have his fair share of negative runs. He's also going to hit some home runs. Those home runs are a lot more valuable for the Bills than the Eagles. Why? It's really simple, actually. The Bills have a defense that can shut you down and don't have an offense as explosive as Philly does. If McCoy gets those one to two homers a game, that's going to help Buffalo win games because it will only need like 20 points to win a game. That should be enough for that form formidable defense. The Eagles D is sneaky good too, but Chip Kelly games have more plays, more possessions, and more points. Those one to two homers aren't going to cut it. Mike and I did a show about a month ago uh, ranking the best front sevens in the game, and we both had Buffalo at number one. That defensive line is flat out unfair. I mean, Mario Williams, Kyle Williams, Marcel Darius, and Jerry Hughes not freaking fair. And the linebacking core is actually a bit underrated too. Nobody knows who Preston Brown and Nigel Bradham are outside of Buffalo. Well, I do, but okay. And McCoy wasn't the only big name the Bills brought in this offseason. They also acquired Percy Harvin and Charles Clay. They're giving guard Rich, Richie Incognito another chance. And they traded for, well, quarterback Matt Castle, but obviously we know he's not with the team anymore. They also re-signed Hughes. And in all, the Bills dished out $91 million guaranteed dollars. It's a lot of money, but the fans have been doing a lot of waiting. All right, before I go position by position, uh, let me just say that my rankings can be found below in the description box. I got unit rankings. I got numbers besides each player. Uh, so make sure you check them out. And, uh, you know, if you disagree with anything, let me know in the comment, comment section below. Position by position we go now. Let's start with the mess at the quarterback situation, uh, even though it may not be such a mess. We'll see. Tyrod Taylor was already named the starter, but E.J. Manuel impressed during preseason, too. I mean, Manuel's really shocked me. Granted, it's just the preseason, but he still surpassed my expectations. 
Manuel was thought to be an afterthought. Yeah, I mean, he's the same guy to lose his job to Kyle Orton just four games into year into the year last season. His horrible inaccuracy was the main reason why. He, I mean, he just lacked consistency. But the footwork in the pocket has looked better, and he's putting his passes on the number. Nobody has ever questioned Manuel's work ethic, and maybe, just maybe, just maybe, it's starting to pay off. Taylor's gotten his chances, too. The mobile and elusive, uh, you know, Tyrod has always been underrated in Baltimore, in my opinion. Granted, he hasn't gotten much action in the regular season, but whenever I've watched him in the exhibition games, he looks sharp. Castle was brought in to be more of a game manager and let the running game take care of the offense, but he looked really, really bad, and he's gone. McCoy is the best in the league at making people miss on the second level, but like I explained earlier, his lineman last year had a hard time getting him on that second level. His vision is extraordinary. The way he can find cracks in the defense while on the move is really, really fun to watch. As a linebacker, you think you've got him sized up. McCoy's so shifty, though, that... He'll get to, you know, he'll get you to tackle nothing but air. He's gone over 300 carries in back-to-back -back season as, and has run for over 1,300 yards in three of his past four years. He'll definitely help out a rushing attack that was 25th in the NFL last season at 92.6 yards per game. At 34, Fred Jackson is the oldest running back in the league, but he was caught. That really, really surprised me, honestly. I mean, he's been with the club for so long. Anthony Dixon or Bryce Brown will back up McCoy. Dixon is the power back, while Brown is more of an open field runner. General Manager Doug Whaley mortgaged two future first-round picks last season to move up in the draft and select Sammy Watkins fourth overall. He didn't necessarily disappoint. He led the Bills with 982 yards receiving, but in a class so deep at wideout, I've always questioned, you know, whether it was necessary. Maybe I'm nitpicking because the Bills were picking ninth and clearly wanted a receiver. At the time, Watkins and Mike Evans were the top two, while Odell Beckham was the third wheel. Evans wound up going seventh. Watkins is a playmaker who can beat you vertically down the field and underneath due to his ability to make you miss. He did have his, you know, fair share of drop balls. So, but he's, you know, entering year two now, and, uh, you know, if the quarterback situation got a little bit better, maybe he'll get more yards. We'll see. Percy Harvin will be a solid compliment, although in a lot of ways, I, I think he's the most overrated receiver in the game. The guy's been in the league for six years now and has still not gone over 1,000 yards receiving, but you know, you'll know, you hear from a lot of people that he's one of the most dangerous weapons you know, in the game on the offensive side of the ball, and it's just like, I just don't see it. Everyone always talks about, you know... Um, you know how dangerous he is. And again, uh, the numbers just say otherwise. Some injuries have played a part, you know, but he's still played at least 13 in four of his six seasons. In the past happy era, era that we are now, I mean, you should be able to get over 1,000 yards. The great thing for Harvin, however, is Ro Roman because of how creative he is, you know, getting into that again. Obviously, Harvin is very good at running the jet sweep. There's no doubt that Roman will find great ways to get him the ball. He's truly a triple threat you know, type of talent. Robert Woods is a fluid route runner and physical, which makes up for his lack of speed. There's a drop-off from Woods, though. Chris Hogan, Marquise Goodwin, and Marcus Easley are the other options. Charles Clay is a very good pass catcher for a tight end. He uses his size and speed to create mismatches. Marquise Gray is the backup and a guy to watch out for. He was a quarterback in college. I already talked about how the offensive line isn't going to dominate anyone, but I do like Corey Glenn. Cordy Glenn, he's light on his feet, his arms are like vines, and he's a good run blocker. Center Eric Wood is the locker room leader of the group. He's tough and dependable. Uh, incognito is a nasty mauler as a run blocker. He'll be sandwiched in between Glenn and Wood. Santrell Hender Henderson and Cyrus Quanjo will... Battle for the right tackle spot all season. Henderson had a horrible rookie season. Quanjo needs to improve his footwork. I've already said it before, the defensive line is flat out nasty. Darius and Kyle Williams checked in at number four and five respectively in my 4-3 defensive tackle rankings. Darius is a defensive tackle who can you know, heavily pressure the quarterback, notching 10 sacks. That is outstanding considering how much he's asked to take on blockers to free up outside rushers. He's a long-arm power player who is impossible to keep blocked. He's a great bull rusher due to his upper body strength and is quicker than you'd think for a 320-pounder to close in on the quarterback. He's also great at splitting gaps and finding the ball carrier. 
As good of a run stuffer Darius is, Williams is even better. He plays with a high motor and intensity. He can slip blocks and get into the backfield. He's a lot more athletic than he appears. He does, you know, also does a great job of anchoring linemen to free up the linebackers. Williams isn't known for having a bevy of pass rushing moves. He just beats blockers with his leverage. He's an extremely powerful lower. He has an extremely powerful lower body to push blockers backwards. Three years into the six-year, ninety-six million dollar contract, I'd say Mario Williams has lived up to it so far. He has all the tools. He's got the size, strength, and twitch off the ball. He's a freak of an athlete at six foot six, two hundred ninety-two pounds. He notched a career high fourteen and a half sacks in two thousand fourteen. He's a complete package as a pass rusher. He can burn you around the edge with his speed, powerful enough to manhandle blockers with a bull rush, and uses his hands to shed blocks. As a run stuffer, he's strong at the point of attack, consistently ho holding his ground against opposing right tackles. He really gets driven backwards. Everyone talks about Mario Williams, Kyle Williams, and Darius in that scary defensive line, but don't sleep on Hughes either, who's tallied consecutive 10 sack seasons. The speed rusher has a supremely quick get-off and showcases great flexibility when bending around the edge. He also has the lateral agility to cr cut across a lineman's face and win inside. In run support, he holds his own despite being just 6'2", 254 pounds, but his speed is what he uses to his advantage, especially in pursuit and cutting off a ball carrier before they can turn the corner. Alex Carrington, Stephon Charles, and Corman Bryant provide depth inside. It's a shame uh, Darius, Jarius Wynn tore his ACL because he was you know, really solid coming off the pine. Let's talk a little bit about Bradham and Brown now because there's no doubt about it. They are definitely underappreciated. Brown stepped in for the injured Alonzo last year and didn't disappoint, filling in admirably. His play was a reason why trading for a McCoy was such an easy decision. He's good in coverage. He's fast on tape. Led the team in tackles, six of them coming behind the line of scrimmage. Bradham is a downhill thumper who does a solid job at stopping the run. He also showcased some you know, solid coverage ability as well. Manny Lawson will start at the other outside linebacking spot opposite Bradham. He's converting from defensive end, so we'll see how that works out. The depth behind the starters, however, is pretty scarce. The best quarterback on the team last year was Corey Graham, but because he wasn't going to start over Leotis McKelvin or Stephon Gilmore, the Bills decided to move him to free safety. I think it's a great decision. He broke up 16 passes a year ago and showed how smart in a physical corner he was. Uh, I'm really curious you know, how he ch handles that position change. He should be able to take some tips from Aaron Williams, who's the other starter at safety and a former corner as well. He's physical, too. Uh, Gilmore is a long, agile, and physical corner. He has good ball skills as well. McKelvin has had an up-and-down career. He had four interceptions in ten games last season, but I don't think he played as well as the, the numbers might suggest. He's very fast. Uh, Nickel Roby is conven conveniently the nickel corner. He's fast, too. I love second-round pick Ronald Darby. He's got speed, physicality with his press, and athletic. He'll, it looks like he's going to start the first six games uh, for McKelvin due to injury. Dan Carpenter has a big leg and even hit one from 58 yards a year ago. Colton Schmidt will handle the punting duties. Harvin will return kick, something he's very good at, while Marcus Thigpen will take back the punts. So, prediction time. I'm trying to remember what I wrote down for the Bills, actually. I'm, I'm, I, it was either 8-8 eight, eight or 9-7. I, I, think, I think I have him at 9-7. and seven. Um... You know, uh, it'll be interesting to see. Um, actually, I think I think I have him at eight and eight. I think that's where I have him. Um, you know, I I don't know. Um, it's it's kind of a tougher division this year. You know, um, I think they're a better team, but I don't think they're going to have a better record. If that makes any sense, uh, and their schedule is going to be a little bit tougher. Um, Patriots are, are still up top of the division. The Dolphins are a lot better this year, and uh, I don't want people to sleep on the Jets either with, with that defense that they have. Um, they might be okay, too. So the Bills I have at 8-8. Eight and eight. Um, That's what I have. You guys will probably disagree with me. You know, the, the Bills are kind of like a trendy, sexy wild card pick, um, but I'm not seeing it yet. You know, I, I, I you know, Tyrod Taylor's a quarterback. I'm not really buying that. Um you know, I, I think there's some things that, you know, need to be improved. Uh, the offensive line isn't good enough either, I don't think. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. I could be wrong, but I'm thinking 8-8. Eight and eight. Uh, They won't make the playoffs, and that's that. So 
Uh, make sure you follow me on Twitter at the Bitter Birds. If you disagree with me, Buffalo fans, let me know in the comments section. Let's talk later.